October meeting of the Transport um, Scrutiny Subcommittee, our question and answer session, and a um, uh, warm welcome to Councillor Ian Ward, who is our um, Transport Portfolio Holder for the um, West Midlands Combined Authority. And I think as um, a number of us are um, here for the first time in, in person again, I'd like to just go around the room and, and um, ask people to introduce themselves very briefly. Um, so starting on my right. Uh, Councillor Barbara McGarity, Warford Hampton Council. Kate Taylor, Head of Finance Business Partner for the Combined Authority. A bit late, so I'll have a pick up the music afterwards. Thanks. Uh, hi, Kashmir Hawker, representing the West Midlands Young Combined Authority. Martin, you're next to introduce yourself. Martin McCarthy, Solihull, Mr. Bolton Borough Council. I'm Councillor Teddy Modena, I'm representing Sandal Council. And then we've got um, a number of um, um, Councillor Hare from Coventry, and um, you're joining us online. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gurdiv here from City of Coventry. City of Coventry. And then we've got Anne Shaw, um, David Harris, and Ad, um, Adam Harrison. Ian Kettle. And, and Councillor, I'm sorry, Ian. <laughs> Ian Kettle, please, Councillor Kettle, please introduce yourself. You're on mute, Ian. Ian K. <laughs> uh. I do apologise. Um, Ian oh. Kettle, uh, Dudley, um, Dudley Met. Thank you. We wish you a swift recovery and your wife a swift recovery after after COVID. But thanks for joining us online. Thank you. Yeah. And so, Anne Shaw, Managing Director of Transport for West Midlands. And we've got David and Adam. Don't be shy. Do, do tell us who you are. <laughs> Most of us know, but well, just, just let us know. David, you go first. I'm David Harris, Transport Strategy and Place Manager at TFWM. Welcome. Morning, everyone. So, Adam Harrison, uh, TFWM's Policy and Strategy Team. Thanks. Great to have you with us, Adam. OK, then, so moving on, um, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest from members of the committee um, which relate to this meeting? Kashmir. Yes, this is just a, I think it was described as a non-producery with the fact that I'm, uh, my day job is on the organising committee for the Commonwealth Games. And so Kashmir's um, registering a non-pecuniary interest, so we, we've noticed, noted that, but thank you. Um, okay then, without further ado, then let's move on to um, uh, our question and answer session with Councillor Ian Ward. With, with um, He's got many hats, but today he's wearing his um, transport portfolio lead for the West Midlands Combined Authority. And you know, I know, know um, how extremely busy Ian is with, you know, with everything going on in Birmingham and his various roles. So I'm extremely um, pleased that he's given us the time to, to uh, have a question and answer session today. And I'd like to hand over to Ian now for his opening statement about his uh, vision and priorities um, in the transport portfolio. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for um, indicating to me the um, the areas that you wish to discuss um, this morning, those being the Commonwealth Games, um, the bus network generally, the transport levy and uh, capital programme uh, or capital projects that we have running across uh, the region. Um, let me just start by saying that um, the government have um, brought forward um, two schemes um, in order to um, bring funding together as we go forward. The first one is the uh, bus service improvement plan, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a, uh, a moment. Um, and the other one is the uh, city regional sustainable transport settlement. Uh, and that second one, the city regional sustainable transport settlement, brings together uh, a number of uh, funding pots. The um, in which includes the highways maintenance block, the integrated transport block, and the final year of transforming city funds. And governments are indicating two things. First of all, that they are wanting to move towards a single consolidated multi-year transport settlement, which would be um, a step forward. So we'd have a single pot uh, spread over a number of years. Uh, and they're also saying that in order to access this funding, and indeed, Similar uh, similar rules apply to the uh, bus service improvement plan. Um, that uh, transport authorities are going to have to demonstrate efforts to remove carbon from the transport network. Uh, 
uh, be contributing to the levelling up uh, agenda and be moving to uh, transport in a more sustainable way. So um, we're being nudged or pushed depending on your uh, standpoint, uh, in the direction of uh, taking carbon out of the transport uh, network. And of course, just to remind everybody, um, transport does have a, a role to play in the inclusive growth agenda. There are one third, I think, of people living across the West Midlands who do not have access to a car, and therefore they are reliant upon other forms of transport to go about their daily lives, and crucially, in order to get to and from work. Um, we're also developing a new uh, local transport plan. Um, and again, uh, government is clear that the local transport plan has to um, uh, indicate how it's going to remove carbon from uh, the transport network and that funding will be dependent upon moving in that direction. All three of these, um, these documents have been through the Strategic Transport Board. If you're not familiar with that, that is a meeting I chair uh, usually on a monthly basis um, and it comprises myself and the uh, transport portfolio holders from the seven Mets. So it gives them an opportunity to um, have some influence on the strategic documents that uh, the command authority are taking forward. And in the case of the local transport plan, we recently had a meeting of all seven Met leaders in order to discuss that, because that's obviously uh, a key strategic document uh, going forward. And that local transport plan has been the subject of a transport green paper that's currently out prompting discussion and debate across the region on uh, the transport plan that we'll bring forward. Uh, moving on then to the subjects you want to talk about, Commonwealth Games. Uh, obviously, we're less than a year away now from hosting uh, this fantastic event. Uh, if you're not aware, the uh, opening ceremony is on Thursday, the 28th of July next year, and it runs through to Monday, the 8th of August. 11 days of competition when we'll have uh, some of the world's best athletes competing in Birmingham and the wider region. And there are 14 different competition venues that will be operational each day. And obviously, transport's a key uh, element um, in, in the Games. Uh, as we get to the Games, the two biggest risks will be transport and security. So uh, uh, Transport for West Midlands and Birmingham City Council are working very, very hard on ensuring that we get the transport uh, right. That's both in terms of um, officials and athletes who need to be got to the venues and also um, spectators. And we are expecting uh, in excess of a million visitors over those 11 days uh, to the city and the wider region uh, for the Games. So uh, in order to um, ensure that we get the transport right, there is a Games transport plan that has been uh, published and consulted on over, over this summer. The final publication of that transport plan, when it will become a statutory plan, will be in January of next year when it goes through um, the CA board. Uh, of course, the Games themselves have also given us the opportunity to uh, bring forward a transport legacy for the city and the wider region uh, and also uh, improve public realm, particularly at Games venues and in Birmingham city centre. And I'm sure you'll be aware that the A45 and A34 sprint routes that are currently under construction, the, those programmes have been accelerated as a result of the Games. Also, University Station at the University of Birmingham is receiving significant investment. Perry Bar Station, of course, which is the nearest railway station to the athletic stadium. Uh, and there is, of course, a new cycle lane that runs up the A34, connecting the uh, city centre in Birmingham to um, what would have been the Games Village uh, and also will ultimately go on to the uh, athletic stadium itself. Now, with all of those venues, obviously, there's uh, different logistical requirements in order to get um, spectators and officials and athletes to the different venues. But probably the, the critical one is Alexander Stadium because that hosts opening and closing ceremony and the athletics uh, uh, events. Um, with the Alexander Stadium, there's going to be a significant number of buses going up the A34, uh, shuttling um, spectators to and from that venue. So as a result, there are two transport miles within Perry Park that are being constructed, one for the shuttle buses for spectators and the other for athletes, officials and games family transport. That uh, th those, those transport miles are having to be constructed to full carriageway standard, but they are temporary and the park will be re returned to its uh, former glory post-games. Uh, post 
So as I've said, um, uh, TFWM are um, developing the uh, transport uh, uh, plan, which will become a statutory plan, and they're also working on transport specification for games time, which is identifying the level of demand and what the capacity requirements are going to be. Happy to take any questions that you might have on that a little later, but let me move on to the, uh, the bus uh, network. Uh, first of all, we have a bid in um, zero emission vehicles to the government. Um, the an acronym for this is ZEBRA. So we have a ZEBRA bad bid in. We are one of only six um, bidding authorities to be taken through to phase two. And we've got our full business case in with DFT uh, for phase two. It's a bid for £54.9 million. Uh, the overall value of the bid, though, is close on £150 million because the transport operators themselves if we are successful with this, we'll be contributing some £91 million to this. And if this bid is successful, uh, and it's primarily a hydrogen bus project, it will um, it will lever 200 new hydrogen double-decker buses that will operate uh, in, in the region. And it gives us, what I'm told, is the largest hydrogen bus um project uh, anywhere in, in the world if we are successful for this. It also includes uh, the world's largest bus rapid transit system with 24 articulated hydrogen buses that will be operating uh, on the A45 and the A34. Um, and it also includes uh, seven single deck uh, electric buses that will be on bus services in Wolverhampton, a new pentagraph that built at Bilston bus station and two um, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen refueling bus depots uh, for the region uh, as well. So hopefully we will be successful with that because uh, it's the only bid in uh, that um, that's um, piloting hydrogen and hydrogen technology. So I think there is a real hook here for the government because there's a real opportunity to test out that technology here in the West Midlands. The bus service improvement. Um, I think just in view of the time, I think because I think I think. Um... Because we've got. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go with questions if you prefer to do it that way, Liz. More than happy. And it's just that, that um, some of the some of the ground that you covered on the Commonwealth Games um, um, topic already starts to get into the territory that we want to ask for the question. So I think if we do it um, section by section. Um, okay. So I yeah, um, so I think we were expecting sort of, you know, just a five minutes of um, vision statement, but we, you're already you know, in, in, inspiring us with what you're saying. But I think probably just for just for the sort of um, flow of the session, if we could just ask the question, the questions that relate to the Commonwealth Games first and then move on and pick up um, the questions about the bus network after um, after that. So I'm going to um, open it up now to members of the committee. And I think the first question which related to the um, Commonwealth Games was from Councillor Barbara McGarrity, Wolverhampton. So over to you, Barbara. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I know you've already mentioned it, Ian, but the, the actual question is uh, what plans are in place to manage the flow of athletes, spectators and daily commuters? This is why I decided to help the hiccups. <laughs> and daily commuters at peak times during the Commonwealth Games. Well, where we are at the moment with this, because remember, we've still got um, some time to go, although, as I said earlier, we're less than a year away now. So the Games Transport Plan, which is the strategic plan for uh, transport for, for the Games, has been consulted on over the summer. It will be uh, adopted as a statutory plan January of 2022. And then the very detailed work on the question you're asking about um, what capacity requirements will be needed, what will the level of demand be, how are all these traffic movements going to be um, managed, is work that um, Transport for West Midlands, along with its um, its colleagues in uh, certainly Birmingham City Council, but also other local authorities where there are games venues, uh, that work needs to be um, uh, completed and the specification for how we're going to uh, deal with this demand will be published later this year now as to the actual detail of that question you've just asked it's probably Anne who would have any further detail on that rather than myself <clears throat> yep do you want me to pick that up chair yeah go ahead Anne yeah okay so uh, in, in terms of the planning work that Ian's just mentioned um, there's quite a bit of work being done in terms of understanding the numbers of spectators for each of the venues, the sessions uh, for the sports for each of those venues, so the arrivals and departures for that as well. Um, also, later when we've got information about ticket sales, we'll be able to confirm uh, the, the numbers of, uh, of the trips that we're expecting uh, from the assumptions that we've made through our modelling processes. 
Uh, we're also looking at how we connect our key transport hubs to uh, all of the venues. So whether it's the accommodation for athletes and officials or whether it's the sports venues or the training venues, uh, we will have a, a series of transport uh, solutions. So uh, that includes the Games Route Network. Uh, so we, we have identified the key roads that will be used to transport uh, athletes, officials and spectators to, uh, from the key key locations to those routes as well. Uh, and then within that, we've also undertaken uh, some uh, initial design work on additional traffic management measures that would be needed in order to ensure that we've got uh, journey time reliability uh, and we can guarantee certain journey times uh, on those routes as well to help us sort of plan those movements. And the Games Route Network isn't uh, just for games family or for athletes. It will, of course, also have uh, the business as usual activities on there as well. Uh, so we're also assessing what the background demand will be in addition to uh, the games demand. Uh, and that, that will help us to sort of identify what we need to do through our travel demand management programme as well. So similar to when the Olympics came in 2012 and the work that we've been doing as transport for West Midlands as part of our disruptions uh, for some of the bigger construction projects that we've got like HS2, uh, we'll be looking at how we can sort of uh, use behaviour change techniques to either uh, remode or reroute uh, background demand uh, and of course also reduce. So where we've got people who could continue to work from home, for example, so that we're taking some of that demand off the network in order to deal with the additional capacity that we need uh, for games time as well. Uh, and that will go into uh, detailed design uh, and those traffic management measures will be consulted on through the usual statutory processes with traffic regulation orders. Um, so uh, councillors um, and uh, residents will get an opportunity to sort of understand those in more detail uh, as that work uh, continues. Uh, in addition to that as well, because uh, with the principles of the Games Transport Plan is obviously to be green and sustainable, we've got a number of public transport um, elements to that. So strengthening existing public transport, uh, both to move uh, background demand and uh, spec uh, spectators, uh, but also where we know that we've got uh, higher demands than we can create, uh, we're putting on additional services. We've just procured a bus contract so that we'll have specific shuttle buses uh, that taken people from key locations uh, and then also we uh, are I think about 19 park and ride sites as well that will serve a, a number of venues so people who are coming uh, by car are, are encouraged to park far away and be shuttle bussed in uh, to the to the venues uh, as well um, uh, the, also, some of the venues are in residential areas and we know that we want to try and prevent people from parking around those residential areas. So there will also be sort of local area traffic management plans in place to protect residents and businesses uh, as part of that. And we will be uh, encouraging people uh, to uh, use the park and ride or use public transport in order to sort of uh, minimise the impact, um, or, or, uh, particularly around uh, some of our bigger venues as well. So they're the, they're the kinds of things that we're doing. It's all based on uh, modelling uh, information um, and uh, some of the data collection that we do through the Regional Transport Coordination Centre. And of course, during operations time, we will also have an operational plan for the network uh, working alongside um, the security services, West Midlands Police, the organising committee, uh, and working with all of our local authorities, uh, traffic control centres, um, national highways, as they're now called, uh, our rail operator, our tram operators and our bus operators to make sure that we've got good visibility of all of the systems um, as, the, as they're working uh, and we can feed in and deal with anything that occurs on the day as well. I'd say two two further things in addition to that, Liz, if I, if I may. Uh, first of all, I, I do think, um, if you think about the amount of construction work that's been going on in Birmingham over the last, uh, what, five or six years, um, we, we are fortunate, actually, that we do have a team of people now who are very adept at working uh, on uh, rerouting transport and ensuring transport works smooth, smoothly when there is um, uh, uh, other works going on in the city. And do bear in mind, when the Commonwealth Games take place next summer, we still will have a large amount of construction going on, particularly in the city of Birmingham. HS2 will still be under construction, for example. Uh, and there will be an extra million visitors. So you're talking about almost the doubling of the population of the city of Birmingham. So 
what I'm trying to get to here is there will be some disruption on the transport network uh, across Birmingham and the wider region. However, it's about managing that and ensuring it still flows smoothly. And what we don't want to do, we do not want to repeat the mistake of the Olympics in London in 2012, where they put out a message that actually prevented people from going to London and they ended up with fewer visitors to the city of London than they would have had in any other year. And we want to give a message that uh, Birmingham the region will remain open during the games. Yeah, I think that's a very important message, and it's you know, very you know, good to hear that detail from Anne. Also, some of the the, the information that Ian sh um, shared with us um, about the accessibility of Alexander Stadium, because I'm actually going on a visit there this afternoon. I'm currently grappling with the the question of how I would cycle there, because I know how to get to the end of the A34 cycle route, which stops at Heathfield Road. But after that, it's um, well, I'm I'm still researching that. So. Um, you know, the, the routes through the, the through the park sound interesting and, and it's good to know that they're they're temporary. And I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Mabina from Sandwell, who's got a, a question, I think, which you know, very much ties in with those themes. Hi, Ian. Hi. Yeah. My question is, how are you going to ensure that there is a smooth transition to connect Birmingham to the neighbouring authorities during the Commonwealth Games? Well, I think that's that's very much um, what the uh, the games transport plan is uh, all about. We um, at the strategic board, the Commonwealth Games Strategic Board, which is a meeting of the major stakeholders, so the City of Birmingham, uh, the government, Commonwealth Games Federation, Commonwealth uh, England, and TFWM. Um, mm. We had um, a description of what a journey might be like for someone uh, starting off in Sully Hull, uh, making their way from there to uh, Alexander Stadium for the athletics. Uh, so there's a lot of thinking going into how people will move between these venues because unlike um, the London Olympics, the, um, the venues for the Commonwealth Games, the 14 venues, are spread out over the wider region. So they are not uh, as close together as, uh, as people coming to the Games might actually envisage before they get here. So I think one of the things that we're now looking to uh, put right is to give further information particularly to people who've already purchased tickets and those will go on to purchase tickets about um, what the the best transport connectivity is between um, arriving at various uh, gateways into the city and region and the actual venues for the games themselves. But um, as uh, Anna's just outlined, there's a lot of detail that already has been worked out by TFWM, but there's still more work to be done on this, uh, not least um, the organising committee themselves have to sort out because um, we started off with um, with one village for all of the athletes and the, uh, officials. And so you had one village. So the transport was all from that village to the various uh, games venues. We've moved now to a situation where there will be three villages. So we need to get the optimum um, distribution of athletes and officials across those three villages that work for the transport ne uh, network and the transport arrangements. And that's a, a discussion we have yet to have with the organising committee. If you Thanks. want to add anything, Anne. Just to say that as part of uh, the proposals, we will um, be up updating our journey planner. Uh, and also working with the organising committee on the sort of digital experience for spectators so that we can direct people to the sustainable choices of where they're coming from and where they want to get to and what um, both the, the sort of the base network of uh, public transport and the additional temporary services that will be in place that they can use. And that, that that's part of our travel demand management programme to persuade them to travel in the most sustainable way. And uh, just to finally add, because uh, uh, you, uh, you, I kind of assume everybody's aware of these things, and often they aren't. Um, if you purchase a ticket for one of the Commonwealth Games events, your local transport is included in that ticket. So you travel uh, for free locally on TFWM transport. I think that's a really important reminder because we've got, you know, the sound like we want this to be the public transport game, so we need to keep reiterating that. I just wanted to ask Councillor Rabina whether he's got any supplementary questions or does that um, satisfy your um, information demand at the moment? I'm satisfied, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I mean, we'll come back to you um, in, in, some, in some of the latest subjects. But I thought that, um, you actually name-checked Solly Hall, and that was absolutely, absolutely wonderful introduction to, to the question that Councillor McCarthy wants to ask. Right. How are you going to maximise the passenger experience for those people using public transport for the first time during the Commonwealth Games? 
That, I think, is a very, very good question. How are we going to maximise the passenger experience? Um, there is an opportunity here with uh, the games, I think, um, to try and encourage more people to use not only public transport, but more sustainable forms of transport. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of thought going into the last mile for uh, each of the various venues. If I use um, Alexander Stadium to try and illustrate this, because I think it probably is the best example. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, there's two transport miles being constructed uh, within the park at the stadium, and um, there will be a constant procession of uh, shuttle buses taking people from the city centre uh, out to the stadium for uh, for the athletics events and the opening and closing ceremonies. Uh, but if you, um, if you arrive at Perry Bar Station, uh, what you will then do is walk the last mile. So um, the senior leadership team uh, from Birmingham City Council were all out walking this last mile to see what the experience would actually be like. And the intention of the organising committee is to animate that last mile. So there'll be entertainment as you walk along there uh, so that you are, it doesn't feel like you're walking as, 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 as far as you actually are. There'll be um, improvements to the public realm as well to make sure that uh, there aren't things like uh, trips, trip hazards or, or um, paving loans that that, uh, that are not uh, not secured. Um, and I, I, I think we, what we are doing in, in investing in facilities for cycling uh, and walking, uh, as well as um, the public transport and you having your ticket on public transport, I think there is a real opportunity to try and encourage people to use those more sustainable forms of transport. So the cycle hire scheme, which is where I'm trying to get to, uh, and Lizzie's point about can you cycle to the Alexander Stadium? Yes, you can cycle to the Alexander Stadium for the uh, for the athletics events. And uh, I think there's a real opportunity to encourage people to do more cycling and walking during the games period. And there's a real opportunity to encourage people to use public transport more. I don't think that's really got to the heart of your question because I don't really know the answer, if I'm honest, about how we maximise that experience. But I do think there's an opportunity to, to introduce more people to the experience. And I'll see if you switch your camera on, you're going to help me out. <laughs> yeah, just, just to help you out with that, there, there is um, some work that's been done between um, all the partners with the organising committee on what that spectator experience is. So uh, from the digital to the physical um, and also uh, as part of the sort of wider programme. So the business and trade and tourism programme as well, where we, we, you know, as we've got visitors in this region, uh, we'll be attracting them to sort of look at uh, as part of our legacy around uh, what else we deliver. Um, and one of the things that I'm in discussions with as well is also how do we provide some level of good customer service training to our bus drivers uh, uh, and our taxi drivers uh, as well, because people will be using taxis. And we've tried that before uh, in the past in Birmingham. Um, so that they are probably the first people that visitors will speak to, uh, want advice from, uh, and there will be briefings uh, as well that will come as part of that. So our bus operators, uh, and it sort of creates that sort of one transport community as well. Um, that, was, that should be making sure that we've got the right people with the right information, with the right attitude to give our spectators a, a really good experience as well. And of course, there'll be plenty of volunteers dotted around uh, who will be giving people uh, good direction uh, about that, who will also add uh, to that experience. And I guess the obvious thing that we'll have new facilities. So there's a new station at Perry Bar, a new station at University of Birmingham, and of course these uh, sprint um, bus rapid transit routes down the A45 and the A34. Um, that you know, th this is infrastructure that's been delivered ahead of its uh, uh, schedule before we had the games. That uh, people will be able to take advantage of both during and post games. Great, thanks very much, Ian. Um, um, Councillor McCarthy, do you want to come back on? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. I've got two actually. Yeah. The first one uh, is uh, how do you are you going to maximise passenger security? You have two main areas of this transport and security here so that, that they don't have a fear of crime when they're using public transport so that they do come back. Uh, I think um, that's um, a very good question because the uh, I mentioned earlier that as you get closer to the games, the two biggest risks become transport and uh, having news headlines around the world, not about the games themselves, but about transport chaos. That's obviously one risk. The other risk is security and uh, obviously West Midlands police are leading uh, the arrangements on security for the games. Uh, there will be um, 13,000 volunteers deployed 
um, during the games themselves. It's interesting, actually, um, the level of excitement that there is now around the Commonwealth Games. 42,000 people applied to be a volunteer, 25,000 of, of whom are being interviewed uh, in order to recruit the 13,000 volunteers. So there will be people uh, on the transport network uh, and at the venues who will be talking and engaging with people to make sure that people stay safe, know where they're going, uh, look after themselves, keep their valuables secure as they move around uh, both the games venues and, and the city. With an extra million people coming into the uh, city and wider region for these games, no doubt we will also attract people who think that pickpocketing is the way to uh, earn a living. And uh, we're going to have to work with the police very, very closely in order to ensure that people do not fall foul of crime during the games. And safety on public transport is key, of course, because um, if you're not safe on public transport, you're not going to use it. So we have to ensure that uh, the public transport arrangements for the games are safe. And a second uh, supplementary was, what are you going to do differently to ensure vehicle reliability, because a, a broken down bus is a big dislocation. It is actually, and I think I'm gonna need uh, some uh, help from Anne on that. One of the things I will say is that um, I noticed uh, a few weeks ago in Aberdeen, where they have deployed some hydrogen buses, one of them broke down. And the police, because they heard the word hydrogen, sealed off the entire street that this bus was broken down on completely unnecessarily. Uh, so I do think uh, when we deploy these other technologies onto the network, we do have to get a wider understanding of how they work and what the real risks are, because there is there is no risk of a hydrogen explosion from a hydrogen bus. Uh, Anne, do you know the, the question about reliability? Uh, I think generally <laughs> public transport yeah. is quite reliable in actual fact. Yeah. I mean, obviously, all, all of our existing bus operators have, have got um, arrangements in place. If they have a broken down bus, they'll get to it quickly. They'll put other buses uh, onto that route as well to sort of pick up uh, the load. Uh, so that, that's just uh, normal everyday practice for our current bus operators. Um, we're in contract or we will soon be in contract with a, a specific bus provider for the spectator additional buses, the shuttle buses that I talked about as well. Uh, and as part of that contract, they'll have resilience plans in place to make sure that any broken down vehicles um, are, are able to be dealt with. Uh, and I think just more generally as part of our proposals, uh, particularly around the games route network, uh, where we, um, if we did suffer any broken down vehicle, not just public transport vehicle, which would get in the way of traffic moving, is that we will have um, uh, heavy wreckers out on the network, which will be able to sort of tow uh, vehicles out of the way uh, so that they can be dealt with quietly by um, any, anybody who needs to do that, but also then enable the traffic to continue to flow. And that, yeah, that will apply to inconsiderate parking as well. So yes, it will have been warned. <laughs> um, that's interesting you say that, Ian, because I had the experience yesterday of going um, from from round from Bourneville to Yard, um, Yardley yesterday <laughs> on the 11. Um, and I think one of the biggest issues is is, is going to be the congestion that's stopping you stopping um, stopping buses moving. Obviously, the distance near Sprintney will um, address that uh, to a large degree. Okay, I've got now. Um, a set of questions um, from, from Kashmir, which he's asking um, on behalf of the um, Yum Combined Authority. I'm also very aware that we've got um, Councillor Hare waiting to come in and um, Councillor McGarity wants to come back. And Councillor Adam Hicken from Walsall um, is also about to join. So if we could keep the questions and the responses quite brief, please. But um, Kashmir. Um, I yes. Uh, well, th thank you, Liz, and, and thank you, Ian. And uh, I think because of time, I'm going to keep it just to one of them. Um, and this has come from my colleague and current co-chair of YCA, Aisha Masood. Um, and she's asking, how will local authorities across the region look to control traffic in already busy residential areas as we see a drastic increase in visitors to the region and therefore obviously ensuring the safety of everybody involved within the Games operations? Uh, I think that's uh, covered in the um, in the games uh, transport plan, actually, fact. But let me bring Anne in, who will have the detail. Yep. So I talked earlier about the local area traffic management plans uh, that we'll have in place, particularly around venues to prevent that indiscriminate parking and to protect residents and businesses uh, where we're we expecting it to be busy. Uh, the park and ride sites, which will keep uh, people who are trying to drive to venues away uh, as part of that. And of course, um, we'll be giving out all of that information to spectators about how they can take up those services. Uh, just to say that we've got a number, we've got nine local highway authorities who are part of this endeavour um, and to 
to make sure that we're all joined up in terms of what we're doing, we do have a traffic management uh, working group, uh, which is helping to design and plan all of the traffic management measures, both on the Gains Route network and also on the local area traffic management plans. So all the ex expertise that we have across the whole region within all of our local authorities are working hard to make sure we've got the right traffic management in place. And these will be a public transport game, so people will be encouraged to use public transport. Um, Across those 11 days for the games themselves, we each evening in Birmingham will have something of a party and a celebration. And my advice to anybody would be not to drive into Birmingham uh, on those 11 days of the games, but to use public transport or other sustainable forms of transport. Great, thanks very much, Councillor Ward. Um, I don't know, is, that, is Councillor Hicken actually available yet? Yeah, has, has he got the link? He's got the link. Um, I'm just sending him a quick message. OK, in that case, I'm going to bring um, Councillor um, um, Gerda Fair from um, Coventry. Would you like to um, ask a question or make the comment? I know you've been waiting for a long time, so thanks for your patience. And uh, Thanks, you, Chairs. Uh, my question, uh, Ian, you probably know Coventry is hosting three games at the same time at Rico Arena. And uh, you have mentioned planning of uh, transport uh, from uh, Birmingham station and Bullard, what connectivity plan you have from Birmingham to Coventry? Because uh, we are the part of uh, Commonwealth Game hosting. And any other plan, would you give me details so I can, uh, and my knowledge? Thank you. Um, the uh, Coventry uh, stadium and uh, arena are um, uh, a particular challenge, I think. Uh, the uh, the stadium is, is, of course, on a rail line, but it doesn't have a particularly um, fantastic uh, rail connection. I think it's just two carriages that run on that uh, rail line and connect uh, to the stadium. And, of course, uh, the stadium itself, which is hosting the uh, the Rugby Sevens, and then you've got two other events that are in the uh, the the Rico Arena, which are uh, judo and wrestling. Uh, and there is the... the all of that venue is, of course, outside the centre of, uh, of Coventry. So it's, again, buses to get people from Coventry uh, to, uh, city centre out to the stadium and back again. And then, of course, there's a rail connection between Birmingham and the West, main West Coast main line between Birmingham uh, and, and Coventry. Uh, I think um, you're pretty good at uh, organising all of this because um, there's uh, regular Coventry City home football matches as well as... Um, Wasps playing their uh, home rugby games uh, in the uh, the venue itself uh, on a weekly basis throughout the uh, throughout the winter. So I think the arrangements in Coventry are already pretty well developed. But uh, buses are going to be the key again, as they are with Alexander Stadium, in getting people to and from those three uh, events that take place at uh, the Coventry Arena and the Coventry Stadium. In fact, I'm not giving it its correct name, am I? It will be called the Commentary Stadium for the Commonwealth Games, of course, um, uh, because uh, it cannot have the advertising attached to it. But you know, the, you know the venue I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I do, uh, Ian. But uh, I'm just uh, talking about connectivity between Coventry and Birmingham on that specific time. I think the main connection between Coventry and Birmingham is rail. But Anne, is there is there anything that's in the plan beyond that? <clears throat> yeah, the c connectivity b between Birmingham and Coventry is is absolutely rail. Uh, there won't be any so sort of direct shuttle buses from Birmingham city centre to Coventry city centre. That that wouldn't make any, any sense. Um, um, but Ian, you've described it really well in terms of um, the shuttle buses from uh, the station in Coventry to uh, the arena, uh, and then there'll also be a number of outer lying park and ride locations uh, just off the M6 as well uh, to support uh, the park and ride shuttles. Uh, uh, because there will be limited parking around the arena itself. And we've been working with uh, colleagues um, in the traffic teams within uh, Coventry City Council as well. Uh, so they are part of the, the planning team uh, that are putting this, uh, these proposals together. Great, thanks very much, Anne. Um, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And it's just a comment, really. It's not a, it's not a question, but not that long ago, they had uh, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, and I'm sure they must have had um, some um, audit and risk reports based on that. And I wondered if it might be worth communicating with them about things that they've uh, found difficult or easy or whatever, some sort of communication, because we've already 
got that information there. So it's just it's just a comment. It's not a question. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, we have been speaking to Glasgow. We were speaking to Glasgow when we put our bid together in actual fact. That was when the conversation started. And we've continued to take uh, advice from Glasgow as appropriate. And of course, the chief exec of the organising committee, Ian Reid, was the chief finance uh, officer for the Glasgow Games. So he has direct experience of what went on in Glasgow. And obviously, that's uh, an advantage to our arrangements that we've got his knowledge. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask Councillor uh, Adam Higgins' question, um, Councillor Higgins from Walsall, because I think he um, hasn't been able to join us yet um, by the Teams link. So his question um, is about um, British manufacturing and will there be opportunities to showcase British manufacturing and goods during the Commonwealth Games? And I think he was particularly thinking about um, uh, vehicles, buses and, and, um, that will be used you know, on, the, on the main routes um, for, for public transport. Well, yes, hopefully we will have these hydrogen buses um, deployed and uh, if our bid is successful with government and uh, we'll, as I said earlier, we'll have the largest uh, pilot of hydrogen technology on uh, buses anywhere in the world. Um, but also running alongside the Games, there's a business and tourism programme which is about uh, giving a platform to businesses uh, right across the West Midlands um, to um, win business across the Commonwealth and to demonstrate what uh, their products and what they're, they're, they're capable of actually producing. So there's a lot of effort going into ensuring that there is a um, an export opportunity for local businesses uh, arising from the Commonwealth Games. And of course, the uh, Commonwealth Games themselves and um, the opportunities for both construction and uh, other products that are needed is afforded to local businesses. And the expectation is that local businesses will capture the lion's share uh, of that work. Uh, and that's based upon the numbers uh, from Glasgow. So we think there'll be uh, an economic boost to the region of somewhere between three quarters and a billion pounds as a result of, a result of hosting the Games. Great. Thanks very much, Councillor Ward. And I'm sure that um, um, Adam will have a chance to look at the, at the YouTube video if he hasn't been able to see that in live just now. So um, if we we move on now back back to um, where I stopped you in full flow when you were talking about um, buses and precisely the, the hydrogen um, pilot. But we've got you know, just a couple of questions relating to the, the bus network. Um, now, I'm certainly very interested to hear what you were saying about the quality of experience of, of being on a bus, because at the moment, you know, the, the experiences that I'm having on buses are that they're um, either absolutely devoid of passengers or they're you know, at busy times they're almost as busy as they were um, uh, pre-pandemic and there's the whole issue of people not wearing masks which I think you know is certainly uh, is just um, just in, increases the level of anxiety of, you know, of using them and is also you know, um, I think you know, uh, stressful for, for drivers and, 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 and other staff as well so I think you know, there's a whole bunch of issues there but the um, specific question that I wanted to ask um, was really about you know, future bus you know, delivery options and the, the it's a question of, of the franchising versus an enhanced partnership. So, um, at the at the main scrutiny committee's question and answer session with with Andy Street last week, this this came up. But I wanted to just ask you, what are your thoughts at the moment on on um, bus franchising versus enhanced partnerships in view of the work that the the that the, the CA has got ongoing on those two options? Uh, well, thank you, Liz. Yes, um, work is going on both options because um, in order to uh, access the funding for the bus um, service improvement uh, plan, the, there's uh, three billion pounds nationally uh, available of funding, uh, which sounds like a lot of money, but it, it, it won't uh, be enough to um, improve bus services to where we need them uh, to be. So hopefully there will be future allocations of funding coming out of government. But in order to access that money, we do have to have either an enhanced partnership or a franchise scheme in place. And we need to make this decision by the 31st of March next year. Now, uh, Pete Bond, who some of you hopefully know, uh, has been looking uh, at this in some quite uh, detail. And it does appear at the moment that franchising would indeed provide some advantages to us. Uh, in operating the uh, bus services across uh, the West Midlands. Needs to be further work done on it, and hopefully it won't end in a row because the final decision on whether we have a franchise scheme or not sits solely with the mayor rather than uh, with the uh, seven metropolitan leaders. Um, but I would have thought if the work that's being done demonstrates that franchising is the best option, that will be the uh, the route that we actually go down uh, what we want, of course, is um, a bus network 
that works for the people of this region. I do think there is an issue, uh, Liz, that you've raised about uh, people uh, patronage returning to uh, two bus services because, of course, at the moment, uh, Transport for West Midlands are um, giving the subsidy to um, to bus operators uh, at the pre-pandemic level. So they're paying uh, the bus operators for the uh, both the statutory and non-statutory concessions at the uh, the right pre-pandemic. Uh, now that will uh, run through to the end of this financial year. And indeed, the uh, the government are providing uh, financial support to operators that runs through to the end of this financial year. If numbers do not return back to the bus network, there is clearly going to be a problem uh, with the uh, the services that uh, are operating. We're likely to see a reduction in service if numbers do not return. So that's going to be something that we're going to need to closely monitor as we get towards the end of this financial year. Thanks very much, Ian. And I think you know, it's important to say you know, that the bus operators that we've got you know, across the, the, the region are doing their utmost to ensure you know, that, that um, the safety of passengers. You know, so I, you know, on the buses that I, I was on yesterday, there were signs you know, on the windows that are being kept open, information about cleaning that's being done every time the bus returns to the depot, you know, and signs everywhere encouraging people to wear masks. You know, so it's you know about encouraging that behaviour. And I personally feel that actually it does require some some direction. From government and I know that there were discussions in the CA um, about whether um, the Midland Metro should introduce you know, mask wearing as a condition of carriage, carriage and I think there was a decision that was made not to do that because it would have placed the onus on the staff of the Midland Metro to try and enforce it because the because as long as it's not statutory and directed by government police do not have powers to enforce so I think that that whole I'm, I'm, I'm dwelling on that because I am you know I'm dependent on public transport and the fact that, you know, that people aren't wearing masks I think is a deterrent to a lot of people um, you know, to, to returning to public transport and that's a, a big issue um, and I think it's going to continue to be so for the next few months. Um, what I would say on that Liz is, is even on um, London transport where um, they have made the wearing of, of, of masks uh, a condition of, of, of carriage. I was down in London a couple of weeks ago and on the London Underground the majority of people are not wearing masks. I had the same experience Ian because I had to you know, pass through London on, on, on um, Wednesday and um, Yes, on, on the tubes that I took, you know, that I would say probably you know, uh, probably about sixty percent of people wearing masks. But I think that at least that's you know, some sign of you know of the the transport authority then using the powers that it's got. So I I just feel that there's a, just a lack of direction and, and leadership, and I'm going to come centrally on that. But let's move on because I'm aware of the time. Um, the next question um, um, was about um, air quality and um, uh, how this relates to the bus network, and that's from Councillor McCarthy. Right. This <clears throat> This is about zero emission vehicles. Could you tell me what the timescales are for the rollout of zero emission vehicles? You've covered some of this already, but uh, is there any more information? Uh, yes, so uh, let me just get the, um, the report that went through uh, the board. Um, and while I'm just looking to find the relevant paragraph, if I say that um, the hydrogen buses, uh, if we are successful with this bid and we get to deploy them on the network, the hydrogen buses actually clean the air as they uh, as they drive through it, as they um, operate. So as I mentioned earlier, we're into phase two uh, of the um, competition and we're up against five other areas and we are expecting, I cannot put my finger on the relevant paragraph in this report that says when we're expecting a decision. And do you know off the top of your head when we're going to get the decision on the zebra bid? Yes, yeah, so we're expecting the decisions to be uh, sort of tied into the spending review, possibly next week, uh, week after. Um, but there's no firm date. Uh, that That's just our assumption that it will be, be, be part of that uh, as well. And then it'll obviously take a little bit of time before these uh, vehicles are procured and then deployed onto the network. But uh, in Birmingham, we, we, we've we already purchased 20 uh, hydrogen buses from uh, Wright Bus in Northern Ireland, and they are about to be deployed onto the network in Birmingham. So you'll see some of these buses hopefully running around Birmingham shortly. Thank you. Um, we are running quite late. Yes, we are running quite late, yes. OK, so let's move on then. And we've got um, moving on to a, a different topic, which is about the impact of congestion on our economy. And I've got a question from Ian, Councillor Ian Kettle, who's been waiting patiently. So, Ian, over to you. 
Uh, thank you for bringing me in there. I, I must admit, uh, I was delighted with your last question in that I, I want, I, I've got a supplementary on the hydrogen, uh, thinking that really these things, uh, these buses need to come off the, the production line and virtually onto the road. So we have a, a test period before the Commonwealth Games and like a running period so we can prove the, the well, let's admit it, the viability of these uh, of these buses. I know that I'm, they're an excellent project. I'm fully in support of, of them, but we do need practical knowledge and, and experience of, of their uh, being on our streets and how things work out. So, yeah, um, last week we spoke to Andy um, Street concerning congestion and, and the fact that it priced into uh, the report that we were losing uh, 2.3 billion a year through congestion. And it's not only the, the the financial aspect of congestion, it's the the lack of quality of life and time loss that we really uh, need to put into the equation as well. And where I'm coming from is that probably around the, uh, the seven boroughs, we have pinch points that are easily identified. And we need these pinch points to lower congestion wherever possible and uh, really my, my thinking has moved on from the allocation of resources within the CA to eliminate these pinch points to help the mobility of both labour and transport um, through our system. So really Ian, my, my question is how is, are the funds now allocated to, towards um, transport um, congestion within the area and do we have a set uh, principled amount that we can allocate towards um, eliminating congestion? Thank you. Uh, I think um, we, we both, whether it's work uh, being undertaken by TFWM or whether it's work being undertaken by any of the seven uh, metropolitan authorities, we're always trying to uh, facilitate the smooth running of uh, transport along the highway uh, network. I mentioned earlier that um, the government are putting money now into this uh, city regional sustainable transport settlement bid, which creates one pot. Uh, the bid that's gone in uh, for that, uh, we've been encouraged to bid for a, a sum of money between 700 million, I think it is, and 1.2 billion. We've actually over-programmed uh, our bid by some uh, 30%. Um, up to, I think it's one point, I'm struggling to find a number in this report, but I think it's 1.7 billion. Um, and if we are successful with this bid, there will be an uplift because the integrated transport um, block is uh, included in this. Uh, and what uh, was written into the report that was agreed at the CA board was an uplift of 21% uh, in the integrated transport budget, which is the money passed down to the local authorities. That is subject, of course, to uh, us having confirmation of uh, how much money the government are going to give us. So we'll have to revisit that percentage at that point. But uh, hopefully, if we are successful, you will see an uplift. It'll be the first uplift for uh, a number of years because that sum of money has been going down over the periods of uh, the period of austerity. Um, so local authorities will be able to deploy that money then to take out any pinch points and improve the, the transport network. But what, what I would say is there's only so much you can do uh, in taking out pinch points. And ultimately, what we have got to do is change the way people are moving around both the cities in, across the West Midlands uh, and, and the wider West Midlands itself. So we've got to get people out of cars onto public transport and uh, uh, doing more cycling and walking for short journeys. Because if we don't do that, and this is certainly the case in Birmingham, if we just stick everybody in an electric car, we will reach a point of gridlock and we will have that figure that 2.3 billion being lost to the economy will not be coming down in all likelihood it will go up because we'll just see people sat in cars unable to go anywhere so we, we can do what we can with the current uh, the current network to uh, enable transport to move move more smoothly uh, but ultimately we're going to have to be giving priority to public transport cycling and walking on the network which means squeezing the amount of space that's available for private cars because we've got to change the way people move around. That's essential not only for keeping people on the move, but also for taking carbon out of the transport network as well. Great, thanks Ian. Um, Councillor Kettle, do you have any supplementary questions? Do you want to come back? No, I'll that? leave it at that. I'll leave it at that, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for your cooperation. Okay, in, 
So picking up that theme of how we need um, change the way that people move around and give people a range of options so that they don't have to go uh, as um, in their car, you know, often as the only person in their car and then sit in a traffic jam. Um, I want I wanted to ask um, Ian about the, um, the progress on the metro extension, particularly the, the Wensbury Briley Hill extension, because um, we know, you know from you know, from colleagues across the CA um, the, the importance of that connection. And are you confident it's going to be delivered um, on time? And have we secured the budget for it? The Wensbury to Briley uh, Hill metro extension. So um, we've got. Um, the procurement of that uh, that extension actually took longer than was anticipated and didn't uh, get finally approved until October of uh, 2020. So construction work started later than planned, but it is now underway in Dudley Town Centre and along the old railway uh, corridor. A number of bridges have been replaced um, and the main track works have now commenced onto Castle Hill. Um, so. Um, this is proceeding, uh, I think, uh, according to a schedule. But let me just bring in Anne, who probably has more detail than I do on exactly where we are with it. Yeah, so, so the uh, extension through to Dudley is well underway, as Councillor Ward has just said. Um, obviously, the, the funding uh, that we've secured for the delivery of this is predicated on the uh, fare box as well. Uh, and as always with the big capital projects, we will have a number of review points where we will look at uh, the funding streams uh, and the works as they they uh, as they're progressing uh, as well. Uh, but the intention is for us to continue on with uh, the Metro extension. Great, thanks very much, Councillor Ward and Ad, for, for that reassurance, because I think part of the reason that we um, included this question is that when we looked at um, the financial monitoring that had gone through the, the TDC, mm -hmm. that there seemed to be you know, the, the um, level of underspending against the programme spend. And I think we had some, some explanation of that, but you provided us some, with some um, reassurance. So thank you very much. Um, so c continuing on the um, financial theme, you know, we wanted to come on to the um, Looking at the, the transport levy, you know, the, the levy that's paid by um, the seven um, member authorities, you know, which I know is um, subject of budget discussions um, at, at, at the moment. Um, so the, the first question on that is from from um, Kashmir Hawker from the from the young CA. Yes, and it simply is. And I think I remember asking this last year, actually, it would be interested to know how things are different thanks to COVID and finances, etc. But what are the future for the current non-statutory concessionary fare schemes, which include, say, child concessions? Yeah, they're currently being um, looked at, if I'm honest. Um, the um, transport levy, which, as you point out, is paid by the seven Mets uh, into um, TFWM, uh, that um, had been reducing for a number of years as we went into the period of austerity. And then it's been flat for the last three or four years. Um, but we have now reached the point where some of these uh, non statutory concessions are going to be under extreme pressure if we don't come up with a solution. So efficiencies within um, both the combined authority and Transport West Midlands are being looked at to see if we can take out uh, some uh, cost. Um, but also um, the discretionary uh, concessions are also having to be looked at as well. Uh, as you'll be aware, all local authorities are still under extreme financial pressure. So if I talk a little bit about Birmingham, which I know most about, over the medium term, uh, i.e. the next four years, Birmingham needs to reduce its budget by some £125 million. What we have got sat in our medium term plan as part of that uh, budget reduction is a four million pound reduction in the transport levy. Now, four million pound. If we if we carry out a four million pound reduction in the transport levy, that's going to be somewhat catastrophic for um, non-statutory concessions. So the uh, discussion and the debate is uh, uh, going on at the moment around this. There was a meeting of Met leaders uh, and the mayor a few weeks ago about uh, what we're going to do. There's another meeting at the beginning of November. Of course, by the time we get to November, we'll have had the comprehensive spending review announcement from the government, and we'll also have had the uh, budget announced by the government. So we'll see where we are there. But um, the it doesn't seem to me that the period of austerity for local government is at an end. It seems to me that that is ongoing, and we're going to all of us find ourselves under uh, continued financial pressure, and there are going to be some tough decisions that are going to have to be made in the future. Now, everything I've said about pre pressure on non-statutory concessions 
conflicts with um, a really good piece of work that uh, was done in Birmingham with young people um, about their um, needs going forward and what they'd like to see change. And one of the recommendations of that report uh, was to introduce cheaper travel for uh, young people beyond the age of 16. That is very, very expensive to do. But I think we do have to recognise that young people see the cost of public transport as a real barrier. Uh, and how we how we square this circle, I think, is going to be uh, the subject of quite intense political debate going forward. Okay. Hashmi, do you want to come back on that? That uh, that satisfies me intensely. Yes, thank you. Well, I'd like to ask him: Is there um, have we got any data on the levels of, you know, of use of the of the you know, of the English national you know, um, concessionary um, scheme you know, for for pensioners? The one that you know, that is that you know, is the statutory one, because again, it would be just interesting to know you know what the pattern of usage is now as as we've you know, since we've had the you know, re um, relaxation of restrictions. Yeah, uh, and we'll probably have those numbers. It's both elderly and disabled. The uh, the national scheme. Yes, yeah, so I, I haven't got the numbers to hand, Chair. I think I'll probably need to supply those to you separately. Because I'm aware you know, that in, in amongst transport campaigners, you know, there's a lot of you know, momentum building up you know, behind you know, the question of you know, um, can we incentivise people um, back onto public transport by, by um, um, offering free public transport? But that just seems to be you know, um, really you know, quite, quite detached you know, from the from the financial you know, perspective that Ian's just outlined, and, you know, and the really you know, the, the, the challenge that we're going to have in maintaining the, the non-statutory concessionary fare schemes. I mean, I, I think that you know, there is a you know, you know, a levelling up issue here because I think in you know, when there was the controversy about TfL funding you know, in um, in the in the at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, it, it, I realised you know, that the 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 youth can, the young people's concessions in London are much more generous, and there is you know, free transport for for under 18s. You know, so we've got that disparity between between what's happening in in London and all the other you know, metropolitan areas. So we have you know, you know, there's already you know, um, a, a long way to go, but 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 you know, a, a huge financial challenge. Yeah, and I think you're right, uh, Liz, that this is a very much a levelling up issue. I mentioned earlier that there's a, a third of people across the West Midlands do not have a private car, so they are reliant upon public transport uh, to go about their lives and particularly to get to and from work. So uh, the government, when they talk about levelling up, tend to focus entirely on infrastructure and infrastructure investment. Yeah, it's great to be investing in infrastructure and that can leave uh, uh, additional jobs. But unless uh, levelling up is going to be about people, and unless we're going to connect the people in uh, deprived areas to any jobs that are created, then we're not going to see levelling up. And if we make it more and more difficult for people to move around, then that will, will make it more and more difficult for people to access jobs. And we simply will not level up if that's if that's where uh, where we end up. So, you know, we, we're, we're all, whether it be at the CA level or whether it be at uh, metropolitan local authority level, we're all making representations into government about levelling up. And if I, again, speak about Birmingham, because I know most about Birmingham, um, we're putting a levelling up uh, proposition to government that is very much about people rather than infrastructure. I think that, you know, that's a key point, because I think when, when Birmingham carried out a, a survey of, you know, of, of um, passenger views about using buses, actually... Um, it wasn't the cost of fares. It was actually you know, the the, the um, congestion and the, the slowness of travelling by bus, which was actually the biggest deterrent to using buses. And and I so I, you know, I think you know, that that's very revealing. And I think actually you know, it's the availability you know and the coverage of public transport. You know, so going back to um, Councillor um, Kessel's questions about you know, the um, uh, helping people to access economic economic opportunities, if there simply isn't any public transport to get to, you know, to a big employment site, then you are ruling out a huge swathe of people. You know? So it's so important that we, you know, that we extend the network and that we deliver on these big projects like the, the Metro expansion and, and Sprint. So um, you know, that we're, you know, we're dependent. It's, yeah. it's ac accessibility and reliability. And you can only get reliability if you give priority to the bus on the highway network. And that's why we have to squeeze the amount of space for cars and give more space over to public transport. I think there's also an issue of trust here. There are people that build their lives around having a bus service, like the number 96 over in Castle Bromwich, only to find that the carpet's been pulled from under them and that they now can't go shopping without factoring in an expensive taxi or they can't get to work without factoring in an extra half hour. And there's basically no warning for them for that and no choice. 
Yeah, and this this is why uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the the funding that government are uh, currently providing to operators comes to an end at the end of this financial year. Um, and if government do not come up with um, a better plan, or if they don't provide us with the funding through the bus service improvement plan, then there is going to be a crunch at that point, in my view. Um, and um, what we're likely to see is um, increased pressure on non-commercial routes. Um, and we'd like to see less less routes rather than more routes. Well, with, with the greatest of respect, they already lost their service. Not, they're not losing it next year. They lost it already. Okay. That's all. Thank you for that supplementary. I mean, for me, you're actually setting out one of the reasons why you know, it would be actually um, beneficial to have a have a franchising. Um, system where we actually specify the routes and we're you know, and we're looking at you know, the social value of of, of um of, of, of routes that people are using you know in our in our own individual wards because I've you know I think a number of us have had the experience you know through the reorganisation of bus routes in South Birmingham or the reorganisation that's going on in Walsall at the moment that we've got to make you know, you know, very you know, very um, forthright representations to, to National Express about the, the need the need for, for certain routes and then look and to, to ensure that they're maintained and and that the subsidised routes carry on as well so. Um, there is still a viability question, though, even if you go down the franchising routes, because uh, if you franchise uh, a package of routes and they're not uh, financially viable, then you won't have uh, any operators bidding for them. So it's 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 it is, in my view, a, a better system. But the way it works in London uh, is is that there's huge, huge subsidies that go into TfL. Uh, and if you look at the way across Europe, they have far, far more integrated transport systems than we do uh, in this country. Uh, and the reason for that is they spend far more money on it. So we can move to a franchise system, but that is not the silver bullet. What I think we've got to recognise going forward, and this needs to be a political debate, is if we want a truly integrated public transport system, then that costs money. So it raises the question about how is that going to be paid for and who is going to pay for it? You know, absolutely, yes, because I think if you have a you know, concept of, of public transport you now as, as a public service and a public good, then you are going to have to spend money on it. And um, and again, it's in some of the discussions that we had in the in the committee in in July when when um, David and his colleagues were here to talk about the the, um, the 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 green paper and the work on the local transport plan. I think there's still you know, a sense that, that your experience, if you haven't got a car in the region, is always going to be inferior um, uh, is always going to be inferior to the per to those who, who have got um, the personal mobility of a car, and I think if you if you look at the experience in some European cities, you don't have to feel that you're you know, you're, you're disadvantaged by not having your own vehicle in a in a city like Vienna or some of the big German cities or the you know, conurbations around big big French cities. But but that you know, that's the product of you know, a different funding system and and decades decades of investment and a consent a political consensus actually across the spectrum that it's something that is worth investing in. Um, so again, you know, that it plays back into the debate about leveling up, doesn't it? But obviously we're straying into you know, sort of more you know, political territory here. So um, I'm just going to just bring us then to our, our last sort of um, question that we, we um, planned in advance, which takes us to the city region sustainable transport settlement, which you've, you've touched on a number of times already, Ian, but Kashmir wanted to just ask a um, question about that. Yes, I do. And just to say, firstly, the YCA fully welcomes it and supports the bid massively and only opportunities that will bring in terms of the continued transformation of our infrastructure. My simple question is uh, in regards to what would be the implications if the if the bid isn't fully funded or bid or, or funded to a, a say good enough level, knowing obviously the depth of the submission and and obviously the plans to which the region collectively has. Sorry, which bid are you referring to? Uh, the City Reason Sustainable Transport Settlement. Uh, well, yeah, if we don't get the uh, the full amount uh, that we bid for, uh, then obviously we will have to cut our cloth um, to, to suit the, the amount of money that we do get. But it will make it, if you look at the, I don't know if you've got a copy of the uh, of the report that uh, went through the um, the CA board on this, but if you look at what we're we're aiming to do uh, with this um, with this bid, we're looking to increase active travel across the area. We're looking to improve the equality of access, improve reliability, reduce carbon emissions, um, and uh, improve the, um, the, the, the key uh, strategic um, um, outcomes that we look to, to, to get from public transport. Now, if we don't, if we don't get the money, we, we clearly won't deliver on all of those, uh, 
all of those outcomes. So I, I do think this is um, this is a moment actually with them bringing together all of this funding into a single block and saying we're going to give you uh, multi-year settlements so you can spend this money uh, out to best effect locally. Uh, it is definitely a step forward. But if if the money if we don't get the full amount of money, then we're not going to be able to operate the kind of uh, transport network we'd like to see. And I'll just come back to the, the discussion we just had and Liz's point, because I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with what Liz said. It, when you go to any major European city, you see a properly integrated transport system and you can get around that city on public transport in a way that's light years ahead of what we uh, experience here uh, in the United Kingdom. And the reason for that is decades of investment in public transport and an integrated system. Now, if we if we want to have that, then we have got to decide how it's going to be paid for and who will be paying for it. Me, I think I think we've, we you know I would much prefer it if we had the European model of public transport rather than the model we have in this country. But we are where we are at the moment. Thanks, Ian. I can see Councillor Kettle on camera and he's nodding vigorously. Do you want to come in now, Ian? Um, do you go yeah. ahead? Well, several aspects uh, of, of that. When we visit um, European cities, um, we see an aspect of, of centralised transport, and it, it, it's all right in our cities. Cities, but one aspect or two aspects of, of, of our discussion uh, that's just gone through. One is the the impact um, with young people using our transport system uh, or in higher education. The economic impacts and the and the the lifestyle of the young people in that experience we can tap into considerably uh, by being that little bit more beneficial when we get the chance and the other thing is that going back to the european uh, debate that's just gone on and our own uh, realistic appraisal of, of our problems we don't look at the the distribution of population and our peri what i call peripheral uh, dormitory areas in that Dudley, uh, places like Dudley, we have a, a city centre certainly, but it's nowhere near a city centre. In that, we have a vast dormitory area that spreads from, say, Quinton and Ailes Owen right the way through to Sedgley and back into Cosley. So the western periphery and the southwestern periphery of the, of the, the Dudley Borough is fundamentally dormitory areas. And yeah, and if you look at um, the way the Treasury model works for um, funding infrastructure investment in this country, the, the, the way that model works is you have to have population mass in order to get the money spent. Exactly. That is the reason why London uh, has had significantly more transport investment than anywhere else in the country. And as long as the Treasury stick to this model, that will continue to be the case. So uh, I, I've had this um, discussion with uh, with Ian Courts when he talks about the rural areas of Solihull, and I, I agree with him. How do we connect them up? Well, we can only connect them up with public transport if we're prepared to invest the money uh, uh, on the uh, transport network and the infrastructure that's going to be required. And under the Treasury's current model, that is just never happening. So and, and until governments can face up to and levelling up, if they're really serious about this, they have to change that model until they face up to the reality that um, in order to have a proper integrated transport system, one, you've got to invest in that. And that means spending money on it. And secondly, you've got to uh, spend money on that uh, under a different model than the one that Treasury currently operate for spending on infrastructure. Otherwise, we'll continue to start get the numbers now. It's something like £31 a head in London and £8 in the West Midlands, something like that. Um, yep. the, the, the gap is huge. Yep, yep. I, I agree entirely. Yeah, and that is so important because if you're in a rural area and you have like one bus a day, then you're not going to, you know, you can't use it to do anything practical. You can't use it to go to work. You can't use it you know, to, to um, uh, go shop, shopping or you know, come back on the same day. So then you said you, you know, the people then just lose the habit or the, you know, the expectation that they can use public transport. And they say, so my experience when I knew when I was a student in the, in Trier and Hamburg in Germany, when I, you know, when you register for university and you pay the the the, the, the fees, you know, for um for, for each semester, then you get a travel pass, you know, and in in Hamburg that allows you to go, you know, through you know, the whole conurbation right out, you know, to the to the, the most outlying areas, and you've got a cho choice of different modes of transport. And really, if you're living in the the centre of you know, a, a a big city area like that in in in, a, in France or Germany, then you don't need to have a car, you know, and you or you, you look at some of the you know the options, you know, for, for hiring a car when you need to do something complicated to um, move something or go or go go out, you know, for for a trip, you know, into 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 a more you know 
and remote rural areas. I think Ian's right, we are you know, sort of light years away from that experience at the moment, but we need to you know, start making sure that there is um, availability of public public transport that's regular, safe, um, and you know, um, not not sitting in, in, in traffic jams for ages. Okay then, well, having, having made a slightly uh, late start to the um, the proceedings of, with the technical hitches we've actually you know, uh, I think managed to keep the time now and come to the end of, of the scheduled yeah I'm just yeah just coming to the end of the scheduled questions but we've now got about five minutes if there are any other um, um, questions that members would like to raise I can see that um, Councillor um, Hare still got his hand up I don't know whether that's a new question or a, um, a, a legacy hand as we all tend to call it now mm -hmm. Councillor Hare uh, no chair I got no question I can't delete my uh, hand icon Sorry about that, and my apology. No need to apologise because we've all spent time grappling with with um, Teams and Zoom, haven't we? So um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the room at the moment. So I'd like to just thank um, um, Councillor Ward for taking his time to be with us um, today, as, as we you know, know the pressures on his time, but also Anne and all the other officers that have, have been here today, you know, to um, in case we needed an, an advice and and further details. So. Um, Thank you very much, and we look forward to the next one of these sessions you know, um, when it comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.